Hey everyone, welcome to the Wolf Stand. You got JB the Wolf in the Wolf Stand live. And if you notice here, things are a bit different than usual. I'm directly facing the camera. There's no one sitting on the other side of a table and there's a reason for that. I'll tell you why. So you're about to see a podcast that I did at the end of the year with a man named Lewis Howe. Great guy, has a very successful podcast. And Lewis is also a friend of mine. We live in the same building, right? And Lewis and I have been talking in the past about podcasting, about the direction of the industry. And what Lewis said to me is something that pretty much everyone else has said to me. He goes, can I ask you a question, Jordan? He goes, why are you actually having guests on your podcast? I mean, yeah, once in a while, great. But I really think people would like it a lot more if you just spoke. So I'm like, you know, Lewis, I've, I've heard that before. He goes, no, no, I'm dead serious. He goes, if you test this out and the podcast is just you, and whether you're talking about sales training, about life, about motivation, about your beliefs about current events, what's going on in the world, the insanity right now that we all have to deal with the news cycle every single day, social media, what my opinions are, and what I believe the future holds for all of us. If I just did that, goes, you'd probably have a hundred times as many viewers. You're doing well as it is, but you take this thing to a whole new level. And then every once in a while, when you have a very special guest, yeah, then you bring them on. So I said, you know, Lewis, only a lot of people have told me this and I've been dabbling, thinking about it. And originally, you know, yeah, I love to talk. My goal was to bring all these great people on and try to tell other people's stories. And I, I do have this struggle though, because what happens typically is I'll go on someone else's podcast and I'm like the number one guest they ever had. It soars to the top of the charts, right? Then I have someone else with that same person on my podcast and it doesn't do as well. Hey, cause I guess I have a better story than a lot of people. And also maybe I'm just more interesting. I don't know. I'm not here to toot my own horn or anything like that. I'm not here to get high, you know, hoisted my own petard. It's not what this is about. The point was, is that Lewis, who I really respect his opinion, his, his point was well taken. I said, you know what? You're right. I've heard this many times before. So I'm going to actually do that. So for 2020, we are relaunching The Wolf's Den. So The Wolf's Den now is going to be me, yours truly, The Wolf, telling you life as The Wolf perceives it. That could be me telling you stories about my life, making you laugh your, your ass off one day. It could be me talking about what's going on in the news cycle. It could be me talking about business, sales, making money. You know, how to improve your money-making skills, how to improve your closing skills. And it'll probably be a combination thereof. But what I want to do is for the next few months, I'm going to start changing up the episodes. One week, I'm going to talk about a certain thing. Could be you know, me telling stories. Next week, it'll be about me talking about what's going on in the news. And then I'll bring in only the very, very best of the best guests. But I really have someone that I think can bring such massive value to you that it will be even more interesting and more valuable than my own podcast, meaning with me talking. So that's the deal. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take you right now to the Lewis Howe podcast. You're going to check it out right now and you'll kind of get a sense of what happened during this podcast. I think Lewis is a brilliant guy and you should check out his podcast, which is really amazing. He's got a very successful podcast. So I want you to watch this podcast and then starting next week, okay, or maybe at the latest, I might have one more I have to do after that, right? But I'll do two in one week, all right? And then you're going to see the new Wolf podcast, the Wolf's Den launch with me doing my thing, which is everybody keeps begging me to do that. So by popular demand, that's what's going to happen, all right? So let's go right now to the Lewis Howe podcast. Enjoy this. It's great. And it really is a great podcast, but you'll see why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. And then going forward, you're going to have me to yourself. All right. I love you all. Let's rock and roll. Let's cut to the podcast right now. So they would teach us how to memorize. They would teach us how to take tests, but they wouldn't teach us how to deal with the emotion of failure mm -hmm. in school. There was no class on here's how to overcome failure and the emotional trauma that you have in your life when someone breaks up with you when a business deal goes south, when your parents don't connect with you. And those were the things that I wanted as a kid the most. And I said, I'm gonna create this school, the School of Greatness. And I'm gonna find these tools and these teachers around the world who can share these principles that they never taught me in school.
Hey guys, JB here in the Wolf's Den. Got a great episode today. It's really appropriate here that we have this guest who's really very early in the podcast game. He's got an amazing podcast. He's had a lot of great guests on. He's got huge um, listenership and viewership online. Um, and he's also a friend of mine, Lewis Howes. How are you, See buddy? you, brother. Good to see you, neighbor. My neighbor, right? Lives in the same building <laughs> as me, right? We moved in the same weekend, I, I think. I know. It's so crazy. what's amazing here is that, you know, right now, the buzzword, it's almost like it's almost like a joke. It's like, oh, I got a podcast. Mm -hmm. You were really early to yeah. the game, right? Yeah. So when did you actually start your podcast? January 12th uh, or January 2012. Yeah. So about seven years ago. And yeah. why was There was that? no one was podcasting then. There was a few people. Joe Rogan had a podcast and there were some like tech podcasts out there. Mm -hmm. No one knew how to even find the podcast app on their iPhone. They didn't know where to look for it. It was really confusing. It was hard to upload podcasts then. Um, but I had just moved to LA for a girl that I was dating and we broke up pretty quickly. So it didn't work out. Right. And I was in New York City, you know, kind of riding this high. I moved from Ohio, went to New York City, loved my life in New York, moved to LA and I hated it here. I hated it for the first year. And I was just kind of feeling stuck in my life. <laughs> All right, guys, another great sponsor here who I love. This is Biz Council. Let me explain what Biz Council is. When you have a business and you start succeeding, what's the first thing you think of doing? Well, you want to get yourself a lawyer on retainer, right, to protect you, to make sure that your contracts are in order, you don't get taken advantage of, that every I is dotted, T is crossed. I can't tell you in terms of preventative medicine for a business, this is exactly what this is. Now, the problem is, though, is that a lawyer on retainer can cost you an arm and a leg, a lot of money, right? There's this sweet spot of being a really small company when you don't need this, but then you start to grow. You're not ready for that high price, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year retainer. So what do you do? Introducing Biz Council. Now, it's not a new company, but it's certainly a revolutionary concept that they have mastered. And just, you know, these are the same people that brought you Legal Zoom. Same team. So these are people that know how to execute in this area. They do it exactly right. They're the best in the business. So it's that next level up for contract reviews, advice, biz counsel. Let me give you the exact office. You just gotta, so if you're a small business owner, an entrepreneur, you got to check this out. Just trust me. It's, you got to be protected. It's an absolute must. All right. So let me give you the offer here. I want you to go to bizcouncil.com slash wolf, okay, and have your own dedicated business attorney at businesscouncil.com slash wolf, okay? You're going to get two free contract reviews, which is significant value. Okay, think about what a lawyer would charge you, $400 an hour to review a contract. You get it? With Big Council, you get two free contract reviews per month, and that's only with an $89 membership. It's literally ridiculous, all right? So again, $89 a month. You get unlimited consultations with an attorney dedicated to you, unlimited, $89, okay? It means you have a question today, tomorrow, next month. You have someone on your side. You can just pick up the phone, dial, get a trained professional to guide you through the legal wilderness to make sure that your ass is covered, bottom line. You do not want to leave this part of your life and your business up to chance. I promise you'll regret it if you do. So again, go to bizcouncil.com slash wolf. You're getting an additional two free contract reviews on top of all the other stuff they give you. Just check it out and believe me, you will be glad you did. All right, our next sponsor, the people that help me sleep better at night. Thinking about money and finance. I'm talking about bowl and branch sheets. Let me just tell you something. I, I'm not a great sleeper. I use their sheets. I, it's like sleeping on a cloud in a puff of cotton. This is the best sheets out there. They use the best materials. They have the best, most ethical work practices. The pricing is ridiculous. They offer the best guarantee. But you could like use these sheets for like a month and it's like, yeah, we'll still take them back because no one returns them because they're awesome. Bowl and Branch is the premier name in sheets for your bed, pillowcases, that sort of stuff. I just promise you that this is something where you will feel the difference. You will 
feel more rested, anything like me at least. All I can speak for myself. And I got to tell you, this product is aces and so are the people from the company. It's a great company, very socially responsible. So everything is in line here. So I strongly, strongly urge you to check it out. I got an awesome deal for you. Number one, shipping is always free with Bowling Branch. You can try an item out for 30 nights, risk-free. Okay, and right now, in addition, you get $50 off your first set of sheets at bowlandbranch.com with the promo code WOLF. Again, that's $50 off at bowlandbranch.com, promo code WOLF. That's spelled B-O-L-L and branch.com, code WOLF. Promise you, this is not going to be something that's going to be like, ah, I can't feel. You will feel the difference. These sheets are awesome. Bottom line. This breakup happened. I was going through a, kind of a business breakup. I was selling my company and my my partner and I weren't getting along. And then I was just having breakdowns in every area of my life, different friendships, like everything was just breaking down. It was kind of a breaking point. I don't know if you've ever had a breaking point, right? <laughs> yeah, I have. And um, I remember I was stuck in LA traffic, just hating myself because I was like, I'm trying to go to two miles away. It took me an hour to get there. And I was just, uh, everyone here can probably relate. It's just frustrating to get anywhere in LA if you're trying to get there fast. And I remember thinking to myself, there's gotta be a way to reach people who are stuck in traffic who are sitting in here for an hour a day to go two miles. And there's gotta be a way to give people tools or some type of inspiration, something like I needed in that moment. I felt stuck in my life. And I was like, is there anything I can listen to? Because the radio is just all advertisements and there's nothing good on, or it's the same song over and over. What can I consume that can help me? And I, was, I remember I had two friends that had just launched a podcast. And so I called both of them while I was stuck in this traffic and I said, hey, tell me about this podcasting thing. I have no clue what it is. I don't even know how to listen to them. And they both said it was their best lead generator for their business. It was the most qualified people they have to generate sales. Right. And it was also the most fun they were having. Like the thing they were doing that was the most fun in their business. And I was just like, I bet I could do something that adds value to people who feel stuck. Right by interviewing successful individuals like I had been for years before, just not recording them, right. and share it with the world from my own perspective. And a couple of months later, I, I figured it out. I found someone to help me launch it, edit it, upload it, and I just started recording once a week for a year. I said, I'm gonna do this for free. I'm not gonna try to make any money. I just wanna see what it does. The first year, I think we had 750,000 downloads total doing one a week. And, um, Every year after that, I just kept being consistent and it kept growing and growing. And now we should hit like 65 million downloads this year alone. And it just keeps growing. So it's been a fun journey, but it's definitely been interesting to watch as so many people have joined the podcasting world. Everyone's got a podcast. Yeah. Now. So let's start with that. So in the beginning, so has your podcast evolved since that point? How did it start? Like what was, have you seen like a, a change I, in position? I had an iPhone. I would put it down. I'd record. It didn't matter if it was loud. I would do it in a gym sometimes. It didn't really matter. I just knew that I needed to get it done and out there. Right. And I think a lot of people obsess over trying to be perfect and whatever they're launching a business or a podcast or anything. Right. They got to have it perfect. And, I really just said, okay, I'm gonna upgrade this as I go. I'm gonna get it out there. I'm gonna not, not gonna let that being perfect hold me back. And I'm just gonna keep improving it. You know, whatever is breaking down, I'm gonna fix it. I'm gonna make it better, have better equipment, upgrade the studio, lighting, cameras, all that stuff. And it just continued to evolve. So I just take the feedback from my audience and I try to improve the product based on what they want. And that's it. And did it always start off as it was it a business angle, like self improvement? No, it was more of like, I called it the School of Greatness. In that car, I came up with a name. I was calling one of my friends. Um, after I talked to two buddies who had a podcast, I called another friend. I said, I think I'm gonna do this podcast. And I was really well known for webinar sales at the time. I was doing a lot in my business, creating digital programs and selling on webinars. And right. I was doing webinars every day, pretty much. What kind of uh, digital programs are you selling for? Like, uh, online courses on social media. LinkedIn was my first thing. I taught people how to use LinkedIn because I was on my sister's couch and I used LinkedIn to find opportunities. And then people started saying, teach me how to use LinkedIn to grow my business, to build groups, to get leads. So I started helping people there by accident. That's not really what I was thinking I was gonna do, but I was using that to find mentorship, LinkedIn, okay. and find relationships after I was done playing football. 
And um, that was a re- you were playing arena, arena football. Arena football. So got, got injured, and I was sleeping on my sister's couch for a year and a half after that. You know, wide receiver. Wide receiver. Got injured diving into a wall trying wow. to catch a football. I, I snapped and broke my wrist. Had surgery right here, and um, the dream was done. I didn't really know what to do after that. That was my whole life. So I didn't have a backup plan. I was horrible in school. It took me seven years to graduate college. You know, it wasn't like I went to school to learn. I went to school to play sports and flirt with the girls, essentially, probably like most guys did. And um, I realized I didn't have any skills. I really didn't have any talent outside of sports, or at least I didn't think I did. That was transferable towards building a business or making money or being hired for anything. So I spent a year and a half on my sister's couch. Luckily, she brought me in. She didn't charge me a rent or anything because I didn't have any money. I was living off three credit cards, just trying to figure out who am I? What's my identity now? What are my skills? Am I good at anything? Can I make any money? This was right in um, 2000, the end of 2007. So 2008, um, people weren't hiring people with graduate degrees in that year. And so it was a, a challenge to even get seen when I didn't have a college degree yet. And I would reach out to a few mentors and I remember one of them said, why don't you check out LinkedIn? Maybe you can build some relationships and find some people to help you get a job. I think there are maybe 10 to 12 million people on LinkedIn then. So no one was really optimizing it. Right. No one was really like on there using it. Mm -hmm. Now it's having a comeback and it's got a surgence of energy and attention and people are finding opportunities and promoting their content and all different things there. And I just was on there for six to eight hours a day for the first year, year and a half while I was on my sister's couch, just researching, finding out who are the people on here, who are the CEOs, who are the entrepreneurs, the business leaders in my local community, which was Columbus, Ohio at the time. Right. And how can I email them in a way that they will respond back to me right. and give me 10 minutes, whether it's on the phone, in person, so I can learn from them. Mm-hmm. And why would they want to give me time when I'm a nobody? So how do I want to position and package my profile? It's kind of like dating, but not trying to get in a relationship. It's just trying to get someone interested in me. So I just started to learn how to how to write my profile and how to kind of position it in a seductive way that people would want to be like, huh, let me learn more about this person and respond. So I had to learn about communication, storytelling, copywriting, you know, presentation skills, all these things. So I started going to Toastmasters once a week to learn public speaking because I didn't know public speaking. I started to read and obsess about learning how uh, to market myself, copywriting, headlines, all these different things. So people would reply to me first on LinkedIn. And after about a year and a half, I had one of the largest networks on LinkedIn and people kept reaching out and saying, hey, can you make an introduction to the person that you're connected to? I'm trying to get in touch with this CEO or this head of sales or this marketing executive. And so I just became a connector. That became my next skill is connecting people to help them Mm -hmm. with whatever they needed. Right. And then that led into creating a LinkedIn course and doing LinkedIn events and writing a book about LinkedIn and trying to maximize that as much as I could. Um, And I just started doing webinars over and over to sell the programs that I had. Right. And then people said, can you show me how to do webinars? And how were you doing with the sale? Were the sales strong webinars? Yeah. The first webinar I did um, after a year and a half of like not making any money and just learning and teaching and training and all these things and building relationships. I did my first webinar and I made $6,200. And for me at the time I was paying my brother $250 to live at his house (laughs) for a room. So I, I, my sister kicked me out after a year and a half. I begged my brother, can I stay here for free? His wife was like, you got to pay something. When that was one of the greatest gifts for me, because it made me have to pay attention. When I started to pay money, then I started to pay attention to how I was going to make money, saving money, investing in all these different things. I started learning about money. So it was a great gift that they made me, they charged me two fifty dollars a month. And I was in my brother's place, it was in the summer of 2009, did my first webinar and I made $6,200 and I remember that was more money than I'd ever made in my entire life combined. All the money I'd ever made was more in that one hour. And I told myself, I go, this, I'm rich and I could do this every day for the rest of my life if I'm gonna make $6,200 in an hour. Right. And that's pretty much what I did for the next five years. I just said, I'm figuring out this webinar thing. I'm figuring it out online marketing um, and I'm gonna do webinars every day. Okay, what year was this now? <clears throat> 2009, okay. summer of 2009. Yeah. 
And um, I did that for years. All right, guys, are the great spots here. One of my all-time favorites. We have Oracle NetSuite. That's Oracle, $50 billion company. Larry Ellison, brilliant designer of the best software for businesses in the world. Oracle NetSuite basically solves the problem for all small to medium-sized businesses that are suffering from having a bunch of different systems that don't speak to one another, not designed together in a suite. They don't communicate effectively. They're too expensive. It's just not right. You can't track your numbers effectively. It just takes too much work, too much manpower. And in the end of the day, you don't get your needs met. Essentially, if you're not on top of your numbers, then your numbers are on top of you. And I promise you, with Oracle NetSuite, it is your premier solution for one-stop shopping, for tracking all your financial results, your needs, inventory, receivables, pills, you name it. And this, this is premier, okay? And here's the deal. Right now, okay, NetSuite, this is Larry Ellison's company, is offering you a valuable guide here, a free guide, valuable insights, seven key strategies to grow your profits at netsuite.com slash wolf. Again, that's netsuite.com slash wolf. You download your free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits, netsuite.com slash wolf. And I'm telling you, you want to give this software a try because you will be blown away at how effective it is, both on a cost-effective side, time-effective, and simply enhancing your business as a whole. You do not want to be operating a business without this. It's awesome. All right, our sponsor, Zapier, the company that connects all your other online products and software programs together, right? When I first heard about Zapier and they wanted me to start, you know, doing commercials for them, I said, yeah, I don't really know the company. I don't feel comfortable. So I asked my team, who's like the tech people, they're like, we use it for everything. I'm like, oh, really? They said, we love it. That's the story. Zapier is one of those programs and products that operates behind the scenes. So if you're a business owner, an entrepreneur, you might not know about it. But I promise you, not only does your tech team know about it, they're probably using it, but probably not enough. And if you're not using it, then you should be because my people tell me they cannot live without it. It's great stuff. OK, so I want you to go to Zapier.com here right now. OK, and again, you get a special link for going to Zapier.com slash wolf. That's da- Zapier.com slash wolf. You're getting a 14 day free trial. The amount of time that this saves you in terms of connecting things to other things within your software suite is incredible. Again, I'm not an expert in this area, but I've checked with everyone I know, and they all love this company. So I'm telling you, I use it. My company uses it. You should at least check it out and get your 14-day free trial. Why not? What's the worst that can happen? You don't like it? You cancel. It costs you nothing. But believe me, that's not going to happen because if you're even half as thrilled about this as my people are, you'll be one of their customers for life like we are. The rest of that year... We generated close to a half a million dollars in sales and from the summer to the end of the year. And then the next year, I think we did like 1.3 or $1.4 million in sales. I had a business partner that I was working with to help me with some of this stuff. And so this is like, as a kid who had no money, going from my sister's couch to paying 250 a week, uh, a month at my brother's place, to starting to make a lot of cash, I was just like, I didn't know what to do with it. I just saved all my money because I didn't want to be broke again. But it was an amazing feeling to see like, okay, this is possible, but I had to put a lot of energy and time in into building an audience, into mastering something, and I spent a lot of energy building that, so. Awesome. Yeah. And so what was, so the the idea with the podcast was just just one day you said, you know what, I'm gonna, did you hear, how'd you hear about it? So I, I did this for, many years where I just started doing webinars every week, right? right? And started to make a lot of money. I think the next year we did two million and two and a half million the year after that. And I just got burnt out doing webinars every week, selling the same thing over and over. we started to create other courses and products, but it's essentially I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm just selling constantly. And I'm selling the same presentation pretty much over and over, saying the same stories. And it was fun for a while, but then I just got burnt out. I was just like, okay, I've got some money in the bank. I've been doing this over and over. This is not fulfilling me anymore. This was challenging at first, but now it's not fulfilling. 
And as I was going through this kind of breakdown with my business partner, the girlfriend, friendships in life, I remember thinking, what's the next thing I wanna do? What's the next thing I wanna do in my life? I've got some cash. Uh, I've got some status in this little industry. Like people know who I am. Right. I've got a small audience. Like I've got credibility. I'm starting to speak on stages, whatever. But it wasn't lighting me up 100%. Mm -hmm. And the thing I loved doing was learning from world-class athletes, coaches, people that I'd been around my entire life as an athlete. So I always studied the greats in sports. Right. And a lot of people would ask me like, Lewis, how did you accelerate this, these results financially so quickly in business without business skills? And I said, all I did was use the knowledge from sports and from great coaches and great athletes. And I just applied that to my life because that's all I know. So I said, what if I could interview these friends of mine who are world-class athletes, coaches, who've done incredible things with their bodies, with a team in front of a world stage? What if I could share the secrets that they have with people in business or with people who are, have families or moms or dads or teenagers? What if I could share these things that I've learned? from other people. And I said, I want to do this. I don't want to make it a business podcast. Everyone said you should do a business or marketing or online marketing show. And I was just like, that's not what fires me up right now. Right. And everyone thought it was stupid. I remember calling it the school of greatness because it was like- It could be greatness in anything, right? I was just like, I wish I was horrible in school. The, the, the things that they taught me in school didn't really help me, but it was the lessons from coaches and on the sports teams. And from, like for example, be specific, like what type of stuff? Like when you say, I mean, you learned along the way in school, we would have these scan. I don't know if you remember scantrons, but we'd have these scantron tests and it was essentially sure, you fill in the little, exactly the little <laughs> bubble. And for me, it was just like a way of, it was so analytical that I couldn't comprehend the questions. I couldn't think about the answers. I couldn't remember what I was learning in these books. It was too analytical for me that all it did was force me in ways to cheat. It's ways to find out how can I look at someone else's page. <laughs> I became great at cheating on homework, papers, and I never felt good about myself. Right. But it was a survival mechanism because I couldn't pass any other way. It didn't matter how many tutors I have. It didn't matter how much my mom helped me study for homework. It didn't matter how much I had note cards and prepared hours and hours. I could work myself to death and I wouldn't get good grades. It just wasn't in the cards for me. They, so they would teach us how to memorize. They would teach us how to take tests, but they wouldn't teach us how to deal with the emotion of failure mm -hmm. in school. There was no class on, here's how to overcome failure and the emotional trauma that you have in your life through rejection, failure, heartbreak, when someone uh, breaks up with you, when a business deal goes south, when your parents don't connect with you. They didn't teach those lessons. And those were the things that I wanted as a kid the most, mm -hmm. was to learn about connection, communication, about understanding my inner world. So I wish there was a school like that growing up. And I said, I'm gonna create this school, the School of Greatness. And I'm gonna find these tools and these teachers around the world who can share these principles that they never taught me in school. Got it. Maybe there was a leadership class in college that mm -hmm. taught me something but it wasn't consistently throughout school. It's like how to deal with the bullies on the playground. They never taught me that in school. So how would you, so like getting specific here, what would you say in your opinion, you've been at this a long time mm -hmm. now, right? What's your opinion? Like if you had to break it down to let's say five sort of mm -hmm. things that like lessons for greatness, living yeah. a life of greatness and whatever that might, and it's different, every person's definition is a bit yeah. different, right? But there are, it's gotta be some overarching principles that you've identified over the years, right? The greatest, I start with athletes because the greatest athletes in the world, to become a world champion, they have to have a clear vision. So they're clear on what they want. Right. The Olympians were clear for years. They didn't just say like, sure. oh, well, why don't we make the Olympics next year? No, they it Watch them themselves run the race and win a thousand times when they have a cross. Exactly. Sure. But it took them eight, 10, 15 years of having that clear vision. And the greatest business leaders, greatest salespeople, the greatest parents, have that clarity of vision as well. This is a basic principle. This isn't, isn't something new, but this is what I've learned from most people is without having a direction of where we wanna go, we're gonna be wandering in no man's land. And no man's land gets all of the vultures that are coming after the, the dead meat, waiting mm -hmm. for the dead things to, to occur. And so when we aren't clear on what we want, even if it's like, 
I want to get clear in the next three months of what I want to do. You don't have to have this grand vision for the next 20 years of your life. It can be a six-month vision, but clarity of vision of where you want to go is the first step. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to bring you ultimate joy and happiness and peace once you know where you want to go, but it's better than not knowing where you want to go. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing is clarity of vision. Um, all the greatest athletes have learned how to overcome adversity and turn their adversity into their advantage. So you hear this from a lot of the great athletes who, who succeed or the great actors or business leaders. They had some type of adversity or multiple adversities. You've had much adversity as well, and they've learned to turn it into their advantage, their story. It's their, uh, the moment in their life that really they had a choice point. I'm going to fall back. I'm going to move forward. And I'm going to use that adversity to my advantage. Um, they have these routines and habits that support their vision. There's no way to achieve world championship status in anything without a routine. You can't try to do something new every single day and get there. Right. So there's got to be some type of routine and discipline mm -hmm. along that path, these habits. They have some of the greatest coaches. I don't think I could be here without great mentors and coaches. Um, from every stage of my life, mm -hmm. in every area of my life, from relationships to my physical body. You've got a coach, and, and I don't know if you're still at the trainer, but- well, He's on vacation right now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, at every stage, having those coaches, the greatest athletes in the world, there's no way Kobe, LeBron, Michael Jordan, these guys would be where they're at without the coaches that pushed them and held them accountable when the stakes were high. And I'd say the, the fifth thing, I think the fifth thing, is um, I believe the greats, the ones that truly make an impact, live a life of some type of service. They have something higher where they wanna impact people along the way. They may do it in different ways. They may not be giving back to charities, but they're looking to share their art with the world and impact people that way. They may not be donating tons of money, money but they're doing something to impact people. And I think that's some of the, the key principles of greatness. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of the actual podcast business now, so you've, you're yep. like one of the early pioneers, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the growth of the industry? I think it's amazing. It's amazing. There's over, is it 600 or 700,000 podcasts now? And it's amazing in the fact that it creates more awareness for everyone. Mm -hmm. So anyone that's got a podcast, but it's also more and more challenging to build and retain audience because there's so many shiny objects. Right. There's so many different shows you can listen to. So why are people going to listen to you or to me? Do like, you, why would they keep sure. showing up every week? Do you ever, do you teach people how to start podcasts or you haven't gotten into that? Uh, I haven't done that yet. I mean, I'll just share it kind of briefly when I'm, when people ask, but yeah. I haven't created a course What do you think in terms, of, in terms of, in terms of this popular thing, what do you yeah. think um, the secret is? Like, so, you know, I can listen. There's no barrier to entry, right? So Zero starting now. a it's podcast, yeah, it's just, it's real. I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. not the issue. So anyone could, could buy a mic or two, or even, as you said, you can even do it really down yeah. with an iPhone. Yeah. It's not that bad, right? Uh, you can even forego the video portion if mm -hmm. you want, right? And just be audio. Um, you could put it on Spotify and iTunes. It's basically yeah. Easy. next to nothing. Anchor, you can put it up for free right yeah, away, right, yeah. Right? But what do you think the secret is to having a successful podcast? Mm. Like what do you, in terms of like, obviously, okay, so listen. What does success mean? I mean, in terms of, well, let's look at success as, as people listening. Like there was an artist. I don't yeah, care yeah. if they, they, they think it's great critically. I want people to look at it right, and, right, right. and listen to my music, right? right? So like you want people to listen, right? So what do you think the secret is to essentially launching a podcast and then building and slowly building and retaining an audience? Mm -hmm. Uh, the first thing, I mean, these are all basic principles, but the first thing is most people stop after six months. And if you're going to put so much energy into launching and creating something, like you've got to say, I'm going to do this for at least two years and give yourself a chance because there's so much noise. There are millions of people that follow me and, and most of the people still don't subscribe to my podcast, even though I'm talking about it all the time. And there are people that are say, I didn't even know you had a podcast. <laughs> Right, and I've been talking about it for seven I did that too, years. By the way, and I just thought of mine recently, <clears throat> but still, people say, "Oh, I didn't make it up." I'm like, "Really?" I don't even know, right? And people have been following me for years. Someone messaged me, someone I've known for over 25 years, who follows me on Facebook, who I knew since I was 13. Just listened to my podcast for the first time a month ago. Really? Because, and, and she even she wrote this long message publicly on Facebook said. I've known you for years. Uh, 
I've known about your podcast since you launched it. I've never listened to one episode till now because you finally had someone that I was Ooh, curious about. Interesting. So it's just like, you've got to one, be consistent. You've got to two, be so interesting that people need this information. So captivating and interesting. Either you need to be that, or you need to f have the topics that are, or you need to have the people that are. Right. So you've got to create something that's different because if you're doing an interview show, why would I listen to your perspective right. if you have the same people that everyone else mm -hmm. has on? Unless you can get something out of them mm -hmm. that they don't talk about. I'll tell you a funny story. So you're gonna love this. So we become friends in my building, we speak, and you and you DM me, right? Yep. And then so you sent me a really nice DM and we just started communicating and we see each other every morning. And then like I went, I was in Mexico City, mm -hmm. right? And when were you there? Oh, it's me about um, three weeks ago. Okay. All right. You're going to die when you hear this. This is the <laughs> funniest story ever. So, and I go to a, I get invited to a bullfight. Mm. Now, I'd never been to a bullfight. I didn't know what it was about, right? And um, so whatever. So I go to this bullfight. It was pretty shocking, right, when I went there. But I was yeah. actually friends. I, I, I had met this bullfighter at dinner night before. He was this famous bullfighter named Ponce, a very famous guy, right? Like a rock star there. Anyway, so I post like some images of like me at a bullfight, right? Uh, yeah. And next day you DM me and you're like, wow, I really had you all wrong. I thought that, um, you know, I mean, that's really not a good joke for you to be at a bullfight. It's really, you know, fucking cruel to add all this sort of shit, da, da, da. And it wasn't nasty. It was just sort of really hard edged oh. and not very nice. I sent that? Listen to me, listen to me. So yeah, you said it to me. But you, you sure I said that? No, you didn't. I thought it was you. Oh, I was like, I never no, said that. No, <laughs> no, listen. It was Lewis Cowes. It was like right to It was a fake? It was a fake person? Just a, or? Someone, I don't know. It was someone that had oh. almost the same name as wow. you. Wow. So anyway, so I'm like, wow, I feel really bad that Lewis is offending such a nice. So I said, well, let me explain myself. Oh. I said, I don't know anything about bullfights. And before I condemn anything, I want to at least experience it once. I also learned a lot about the society. And yes, frankly, it was shocking. People clapping and cheering as this innocent bull's right, getting. Right. Right. I'm going back and I'm really trying to explain myself to you because I respect you. And I felt bad that I offended you, right? Because I hadn't, because I'm just went to a bull's and dragged right, me right, to a right, bullfight. Right. And I'm going. And I really explained myself to you, and, the guy, and then you respond to me, wow, that was really, I appreciate the response, and um, I'm glad now that I understand, because I, now I, I kind of respect you more for that. I'm like, all right, thanks, back and forth, back and forth. And, and the, then you say to me, uh, oh, hey, um, I, I'd like to talk to you about something. I, have an, I need some advice from you. I'm like, yeah, well, one thing I fucking just asked me in the gym, right? So I'm like, yeah, sure. So here's my number. The phone rings. It's a four plus four four London number. I'm like, where the fuck Lewis is in huh. London? I get in the phone, like, hey, but it's up. I'm like, that's not fucking Lewis. Wow. I was thought the guy was you the whole time. And I was this whole thing about bullfighting. Wow. Because sure I, I respect you. So I'm like sure, trying to sure, explain sure. myself to you. He's a fucking random dude. Wow. That didn't like that I was in a freaking bullfight. I was doing this whole thing. <laughs> His with, name was Lewis? Or Lewis what? Cows or something. No way. It was like one letter off. But wow. it was like it was like messages going back and forth. And I'm busy. My eyesight's not that great. I'm like, oh, it's Lewis. I'm like, wow. Lewis is real. He must feel really strong about the animals, you know, rights and shit <laughs> like that. I'm like, you didn't strike me. And by the way, you know, listen. It was kind of fucked up, the bullfight. Like, yeah, I'd never yeah, been sure, to one. Sure, sure. But who's going to judge me for going to one bullfight? It just seemed like right. an odd thing. This, right, right. Anyway, that was, I was my... I going to say, I don't remember saying it. I know, but I, but I swear to God, I was going back and forth with you for like a day. I was trying to turn you around. Wow. Like, I'm a, no, Lewis, I'm really a good guy. I, you know, I, wasn't, I wasn't there poking the bull myself and shit like that. You know what I'm what saying? Are, what I was just the... sitting there like amazed that as the bulls die, everyone's clapping and cheering. Wow. Like, wow, what a culture. You know? How was the phone call, Dad, with this stranger? Did you I, I said, did you oh, motherfucker. I said, you know what? I said, today's your lucky day. Wow. I said, I thought you were a friend of mine. <laughs> All right? I said, you got 30 seconds to speak your piece wow. right now. What do you want? Wow. He's probably listening to this podcast right now. And he asked me some business advice, which I don't even remember. I was like, and I gave him the advice. Have a great day. Wow. Take care. <laughs> Fascinating. That? Yeah, that, that's funny. And then I look back, I'm like, oh, fuck, it wasn't Lewis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's it's thing, you know? cows. Well, there you go. Anyway, here's an interesting thing. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny, right? Here's an interesting thing about, about the podcast world, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that there, there are 700,000, about more or less, right? But mm -hmm. I, I heard from someone, a reliable source, that like, like, like almost 6,999,000 mm -hmm get like less than five viewers. Sure, They're sure. very, very small, small yeah. podcasts, right? So the actual number of, you know, podcasts that have traction yeah, is actually rather like small. 10,000 maybe or something. Yeah, yeah, you know? it's probably even smaller than yeah. that. And, and I wonder, so you brought up a very good point, 
right? Something that I think we all struggle with in this. And I just thought of my podcast recently. I'm having fun with it. I guess it's easier yeah. for me than most people because I have a brand, right? Yeah. But still, yeah. it's the same challenge we all face. You know, you want to get great guests and it's almost at the point now it's becoming a cliche bad joke. Hey, you want to come on my podcast? It's right. like, cause get, everyone's getting asked by everybody, right? So, I mean, what do you think, like for someone that's like, that has a, that has a podcast already, right? That's doing okay, like, if it were you, if you were starting again, like, mm. right now, what would you do? Like, how would you, if you were, like, if you were to do it today, right, knowing what you know, let's say you didn't have this, let's say you had the following that you have, mm -hmm. but not from a podcast, what would you do? I would probably do stuff that I'm not doing right now, which makes me think I got to start doing those things. Like I, what? I would create... I would do a big uh, launch. I would do a big build up, like a movie premiere type of launch. I would throw a launch party. I would go all out to build the buzz. Um, I would ask every influencer friend to be a part of this launch party where I could build the audience and the attention to get people to subscribe. I would create contests every week to, and giveaways and contests and have people listen to the show and find a secret word or something where it's like the first person to reveal the secret word gets the, the prize. and and find unique ways to get people more engaged. But I would go- Write that down. Guys. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, it's, good. it's a good yeah. question because, you know, I think we're, we're, we started doing some of that now. I said, mm -hmm. you know, let me start testing some of that stuff out with actually going out there and putting apps, doing some advertising uh -huh. about it just to drive awareness. Because yeah. I think it's, you know, it's like the, the challenge I think for anyone right now is just there's so much noise and so, so much, much clutter. So much. Right, and as you said, you know, it's like it's not just about building your market, but almost maintaining or retaining the people, retaining right? Retaining it because- there's just so many, there's so many episodes to listen to out there. So many people you might want to listen to, but how much time do you have to listen to 30, 45, 60 minutes? Where do you see the future of the industry going right now? I, mean, I, I got to believe that there's going to be some sort of shift here in the mm -hmm. sense that it, it, it's like the wild west right now, mm -hmm. right? It's at that point where like, you know, it's like almost a free for all. I, and I think that the, the wild west aspect that I think that intrigues me is that there's probably some really great podcasts out there. There are. That no one knows about. I think the the, the future is higher produ production, more scripted. Uh, you know, the ones that are doing great are the NPRs, the Wondery shows. Those are the ones that are, have original scoring with music, scripting, transitions. It's just like, it's not just let's turn on the mic and talk for an hour sure. and, and put it out. They're, they're storytelling a lot better with the music, everything. Everything's together. And they're doing a package deal. They're trying to package it into a TV show to let TV help promote the podcast. They're doing touring, all this different stuff. So it's kind of a 360 approach towards a show and taking it to a new level. So with these bigger networks coming in and buying podcasts or buying the rights to podcast, mm -hmm. with the wonders of the world, the NPRs of the world, building out original content and investing a lot of money in this original content, mm -hmm. that's gonna be at the top. So if you're an interview show and you're not thinking, how can I increase the production value? I'm not saying you need to spend a ton of money, right. but how can I optimize the production mm -hmm. so that it sounds more high quality? That's what's going to stand out, in my opinion. So just investing in being innovative, trying new formats, not sticking to the same thing all the time, and really investing in the audience and what they want, and just creating different ways to make it stickier for them, whether that's merch or events or programs or something to get them consistent in your ecosystem. Because once they find another show that's got a better ecosystem, why would they stay with you? Or they might be in a few shows, mm -hmm. right? But you can only listen to what, three, five, seven shows maybe in a week. Right. If you've got one hour a day to listen, maybe you can listen to seven different shows yeah. a week. So you just gotta be thinking, how do I how do I continue to level up? Or, you know, people are just revealing everything about themselves in podcasts. And that makes it fascinating. So how do I continue to open up and, and be less surfacey in any way mm -hmm. and be more real, more vulnerable, more open, like you have in your books and everything about all the different challenges you've faced. Right. If it's an interview show, talking more about that. So mm. do you always, but I think also, I mean, not to cut you off, sure, but no, I think no, please. how many, um, how many, shows do you week do you do a week? that was my question i was gonna ask you how many do, do you do a week right now well i actually so i i, I think I, I made a tactical error in the beginning because mm -hmm. i started to really enjoy doing it and i went from one to two shows a week 
And in retrospect, I think I probably should have stayed at one show or done one show with an interview and one just me speaking because it's just the quality of guests. In other words, what's mm-hmm. happening is you're chasing that chasing the monkey you know, you're trying to get that great guest and, and, and the problem is I'm, you always got to keep feeling the beast yeah and i'm i'm like so always someone's like when i go on someone else's podcast i'm like a really good guest uh-huh. you know and i don't like so i'll, I'll do a swap with someone and that like i'll be their number one podcast and they'll come on mine they won't do quite as right. well i'm like fuck <laughs> you know it's like it's sort of because like, i think my story obviously is very compelling it's mm-hmm. got a lot of recognition so i think for me um i i, sh- I think i should have stayed at one i didn't right. i didn't do the podcast to make money that's me also. My right. first year, I was like, I'm not making any money. Yeah, first year. it's not. I don't think it's about that, right? To me, it was about about you know giving value, building your brand awareness, top of the funnel, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think for me, my plan for 2020 is I'm going to probably do at least if I if I do two a week, one will be just me talking mm-hmm. about a current events, myself, a story. Like that. How many do you do right now of just you? Two. None. 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 Why do people come here? To to oh. Um, well, cause I get a big listenership, I guess. And also they, you know, I guess the celebrity factor, they want to, you know, I think I'm a, I'm a pretty decent interview though. I had to really, in the beginning, I had to stop cutting people off. Like now I let you speak. It's pretty yeah. easy for me to train myself <laughs> to just, to just let the other person, like, wait, wait, no, 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 stop. But, but do people come to your show to learn about the questions you ask guests or they really like when you speak up and you share a tactical advice or a story or something about you? And when you're on other people's shows, yeah. you're the biggest hit. Mm. So they come back to you to hear more from you, but yeah. then you give them someone else. Yeah, so in the in the it depends on the individual, right? So mm-hmm. sometimes if I have a, a guest who's not it's a bit it's a bit weaker where they don't talk as much, I'll do a lot more talking. But when I get a guest, someone mm-hmm. like you, I, I just gotta I ask you a question. And there you go. Yeah, I yeah. let you speak for five to six minutes. I didn't sure. say a word. And you told an interesting story and it was good, right? Mm-hmm. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes someone will start drizzling and like, like yeah. oh, it's like, it's really boring. I'm like, oh, damn, I got to do something here to make it more interesting, right? Have you done any that are just you? No. How many episodes have you done? 50. 50. 50. When did you start? Uh, June. June. This year? Yeah, this we year. just started. So just started. here would be the challenge for you is to try a new format. Oh, yeah. And say, you know, and, and try one month of just doing only episodes by you. So here's the, so, and we're obviously thinking about this, right? Very seriously. And I'm going to do it, right? Yeah. And I'm waiting for the new year. You brought up a really good, you said something that, that resonated with me. You said about scripted content, right? Mm-hmm. So what I want to do is I don't want to just get up and just talk. Riff. Yeah. I, I, I can do that better than anybody as good as anyone, right? I want to combine that with some actual points that have been mm-hmm. already, what do they script it out? But just yeah, like semi-scripted. News points. Bullet points. Things, bullet points of things that are topical, yeah, yeah. that are interesting, and then riff around those. So for that, I need to probably hire one or two sharp Time young consuming. kids. Yeah, exactly. It's energy to exactly. sit down and, right. and, and think of an idea. And, and I get it. And I That's think, why it's easier to interview. Yeah, and exactly. And, and everybody who's met me and knows anything about this industry says you're crazy to do it. You, you just talk yourself. Why are you interviewing people? You'll do so much better just talking yourself. Well, I think a combination is the answer. I think, I think, uh, I think the audience and the market will tell you yeah. the answer. I think you, we can think all we want. Exactly. If you test it, right? you're going to know based yeah. on if people listen more or less. Yeah. If you get half the listeners, then go yeah. back to interviews. I did, now in the beginning, so what else I did? I started testing like interesting people that were outside what I considered mm-hmm. to be my sweet spot. And yeah. I said, you know, I wanted to push the boundaries. Sure, sure. So I had some people that were just like, um, I had some B actors that were funny. Mm-hmm. They didn't connect well with my audience. I even had a dominatrix what? come on the, the show. What do you think your audience wants? I think they want, they, they want either A, business, sales, stuff like that. That sort of bi- advice on business and sales, entrepreneurship sales. And they want the wildness factor of my story in there. Mm-hmm. And I think but you're trying to the, give them, you're trying to feed them something else. And, and it's essentially, I my goal when I started was I was going to bring in all these interesting people mm-hmm. and, you know, extract their stories from them, give advice. As you said, you know, I, I very often, like yesterday, I had a guy here who was um, in uh, the real estate, you know, um, sort of distress sales. And it was, it was one of those things where I was really able to use my mm-hmm. savvy in business to extract his strategies. That was a really good example of a successful outcome. That's great. But it's not always like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and... But as you said, you're correct. The market will tell you at the end of the day. I'll tell you, I think you should try 
in the first month of January, do no interviews. Yeah. And just do only one a week of you teaching something. Right. You know, it could be a chapter, you know, one chapter of the book comes yeah. out each week, but it's a lesson and a story. Like you have a format and it's a 20 to 30 minute segment. Yeah. And you could also tell a relevant story from now if you want to, or you can talk about something current, mm. but. No, I think it's, a, I think it's really good I advice. think doing, you know, four been, or eight episodes. About that. Four yeah. to eight episodes. That's exactly. Just yeah. Like, yeah. Ask your audience, what do you want to learn from me? Yeah. I saw Ed Milet posted this last week on his Instagram. It was like, okay, what do you want more from me on my show for next year? And I already knew what the answer was going to be because I had talked to him six months ago and I said, this is what people want. And what was the answer? And he was like, okay, more, more, <laughs> more celebrities, more stuff on this, more stuff on that, more of my life lessons. And it was like overwhelming, like 80 or 90% was more just like of more life. of my life lessons. Really? It's like they come for yeah. him and they come for you. Yeah. You're right. Um, I, yeah. And I've been hearing this from people and you're right. You got to test it, but I think that's going to be the overwhelming winner. It just takes more time and energy and yeah. focus, but that will pay off. And I, I think agree. that will help your show grow yeah. bigger than the way it has been now. Sure. I may be wrong, but that's just my well, I theory. think you're right. And we've been all been saying that here. We, we, we need to test it at the end of the year. It was a tough few months. I went through a divorce, yeah, yeah. you know, separation. And, um, so that kind of sidetracked me for, I was just kind of hanging on to deal life for, you know, that you've been through that sure, as well. Sure. Right. I mean, I just did a, well, I haven't been married, but I haven't, yeah, I went through breakups. Um, but even just like an easy test you could do is my biggest lessons from 2019. Like you could record this today or tomorrow and just say, here are like the five to 10 things, like spend an hour reflecting on the year. And the biggest lesson from my divorce, the biggest lesson from moving into a new building, the biggest lesson from launching a podcast, like yeah. what are the 10 things that you learned about yourself and how you're going to apply it to next year. People want to learn that. Yeah. I did that episode a week or two ago, and it's one of the biggest episodes of the month. Yeah. They want to hear more from me just like they want to hear more from you. How about the idea of uh, guests, you know, securing good guests? It's the hardest job because yeah. I'm, I'm the booker. I've yeah. tried to hire bookers. I've tried to do different stuff. And um, it's a constant job. And especially for me, I'm doing three shows a week two interviews a week and then one short form. Um, so it's like, I've got three, eight shows. Three a week. I've got eight interviews a month and it's the school of greatness, not the school of average. So I've got to constantly <laughs> level up to, uh, you know, something different or more interesting or something that I think is going to relevate to, uh, be relevant to my audience. I've got to serve that audience at a high level. So I'm always fixated on what's the information that this person's going to give that's going to serve the audience that I have, which is, very broad from teenagers to 70 year olds and it's all walks of life. So how do I think about their mindset of what they're going through right now and how do I serve them at least on something that's going to help them in their life? And is your audience mostly- And they're not all entrepreneurs. Is it US so it's or like, international? Uh, it's, it's mostly English speaking, but I'd say, yeah, majority is US, but it's all over the world. And it's like, they want to learn about how to improve their life. They want to learn about how to grow their life. Some are entrepreneurial and business minded, but a lot are career focused. Some are in school, some are, you know, retired. So it's like, it's not just the entrepreneur show. So I've got to be really intentional about who I bring in and how I serve the audience. Or it's the questions I ask those individuals that's going to serve them on different topics. So it's a constant feeding the beast. That's what I like to call. So you're doing the booking yourself. I'm doing a lot of the booking myself, or I'm just asking friends to make introductions and yeah, seeing. You know. I, I believe the industry itself needs a new player mm -hmm. and a, a company that actually will do the booking that will do the, will get much better ad deals. Mm -hmm. In other words, we'll, we'll, we'll maximize the ad space. Mm -hmm. uh, distribution's easy, but it also will help people grow that podcast. Yeah. Use advertising. I, I don't see that anywhere in the industry right now. Because no one can do it. Mm. It's really hard to do all that. So if you could, until if you could until, tell until me, you if, do. if there was a company that could say, "I'll double your growth this year. I'll get you the biggest uh, people in the world on. Um, I'll do all the production." I'd say how much? Yeah, I'd be like, I would pay anything. The production's the easy part, you know. Production's easy, but I'm saying booking the biggest guests that I would want, the most iconic names in the world is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, doubling the growth, which doesn't always uh, come from getting the biggest guests. Mm. Sometimes the biggest guests actually don't grow the podcast. Sometimes they do, so it's kind of hit or miss on like the celebrity for me. Right. Um, 
Well, I guess the celebrity's got to have something that resonates. She can't just can't be a, just be a name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but if I were you, I would focus on doing solo episodes, one a week for a really? month or two I'm, months. I'm definitely gonna take. Your I advice. would say I would do no interviews for a month or two like and see what happens, and then just be like, okay, well, this worked or it didn't work. I like the it. test because people want to hear more from you. We're gonna stop now, not the podcast, just the video portion. Now we go strictly to audio for the last ten minutes. Cool. Um, we get to the down and dirty stuff now. I had Kobe on, I had Kobe Bryant on, and he, I didn't expect him to talk about love and intimacy and and talk about his heart in the way that he did. But when I see people are, uh, open up in ways that they never would open up, for me, that's just like, it's fun.